Welcome to The Whole Pineapple. I'm Ruby Boris. And I'm Ann Judge. The Whole Pineapple is a podcast about wellness focused around fertility. And on these weekly mini episodes, we bring you bite-sized ideas for you to snack on. Like breathing exercises, book reviews, maybe we'll review some scientific research, or we'll share some wellness and fertility stories from our listeners. So if you're looking for a tip or a trick related to your fertility and well-being, then you've come to the right place. Let's dig in. Welcome back to our snack edition of The Whole Pineapple. I'm Ann Judge. I'm Ruby Boris. And we are thrilled to welcome back Melanie Mickelson. Um, Hopefully you listened to her full episode. She has a long and distinguished bio in terms of all the work she's been doing in counseling, but especially focus in what we call third parties. So people who are reproducing using material from an egg or sperm from someone outside of their own genetics. And one of the things we just barely hit on in our main episode was this idea of what if you're using the genetics from neither one of you, if you're in a partnered relationship, what does it mean to look at embryo donation? So we want to talk about that a little more today and welcome back, Melanie. Thanks. It's great to be back. You know, if you want a real life uh, version of this, go back to Amanda's episode. Off the top of my head, I don't know what number that is. But I was it's just fun. thinking that. I was like, oh, it's one of our bonus episodes and we haven't been labeling the snacks. But yes, um, we have a listener sharing her own story with building her family through embryo donation. But part of the reason I wanted to have Melanie is that Amanda's story is not typical. You know, she right. knew somebody who very early on offered embryos to her and most people come at it, uh, at least in my understanding, from a different way. Is that what you find, Melanie, as well? That's correct. Uh, lots of different ways that people may end up at the doorstep of uh, embryo donation. Do you have any sense of sort of how common embryo donation is? I feel like it's always sort of the thing that we barely bring up when we're having consults because it's not really an option that even a lot of people realize is available to them. I would agree that it is still a small percentage of the total number of embryos that are transferred per year. So SART, which is our data collection nationwide, they have the preliminary report. It's not their finalized report of their 2020 statistics. And just as an example, there were 2,143 donated embryo transfers that year as opposed to close to 300,000 transfers of all (laughs) other embryos at all the clinics across the country. There probably are some people that when they find about it as an option, feel like, oh, that's a great path for us. But at least what I see in my experience is it's more something people start to explore when fertility treatment with their own eggs has not been successful. I would say that's correct. And it can be when without their own eggs, without their own sperm. Oftentimes, I think there's a bit of a misconception where people used to feel like, oh, gosh, embryo donation is so much easier and cheaper than doing IVF, which indeed it would be cheaper than doing IVF. However, if you add up the cost of what needs to occur as far as legally with counseling, with frozen transfers, potentially with shipping of embryos to different clinics, the cost can really quickly add up. And what I have found with people that are considering using donated embryos is it typically takes longer than they think it will. It is typically more expensive than they think it's going to be. And it doesn't mean that this isn't a great option, but it does mean that especially when you've already perhaps been through a lot of other failed fertility treatments, it's not an easy course to jump onto necessarily. The flip side to that is for people that definitely feel like this is a wonderful family building option for them, maybe they already have children. Maybe they want to add to their family for reasons of, um, again, second child, second marriage, let's say. Again, we talked earlier in our first session about the balancing of genetics. So in other words, it is a great option if you don't want to use donor egg or donor sperm 
and you want it to be neither of your gametes, something like donor embryo solves that problem because these are embryos that are already created that then would be neither of your genetics. Well, you mentioned that time factor. I think that is one of the hurdles is I think a lot of people think it's going to be easy because they imagine there's like, you know, a tank full of embryos waiting for donation. And the hard part is there are tanks full of embryos that people are just paying for storage, not intending to use. But there's a pretty tiny percentage of people that do make these embryos available for donation. And so at least what I see is that the demand definitely seems to outstrip the supply. Is that what you find as well? I would agree with that. I don't know if that's going to change in the future with the post obs decision. I feel like some people may be less inclined to keep their embryos stored, perhaps less inclined to donate. The flip side is there may be people that are more inclined to do that, that they actually feel like they want to give other people a chance to use their embryos who might not have a possibility. Where I think it gets tricky is a couple of things people have to keep in mind. One, not every clinic is going to accept outside embryos for donation. So in other words, you might currently be at a clinic, but they won't accept an outside embryo donation if they aren't embryos that were made at their clinic. The second thing, too, is the issue of shipping of embryos, and there's a cost that will be involved with that. The third is there are certain embryo donation organizations that specifically require you to actually travel to them to have your transfer. And again, that can be great for some people. They don't mind that at all. But for others, they don't want to leave the clinic where they already are. They feel connected to their doctors. They feel connected to their staff. And so it's an extra burden to think, and it's an extra cost quite honestly, to think of traveling somewhere. For some clinics, they do have an in-house, what we call in-house embryo donation programs. And those are typically going to be for their patients only. So you can go become a patient there. But I would definitely say the majority of clinics do not have an internal embryo donation program. And I think a lot of patients, they, they think embryo donation is going to be easier in a way that, than like donor egg and donor sperm, uh, because it's like almost the illusion of like a plug and play, like, oh, got an embryo, just got to do a cycle and put it in there. But there's a lot more to it than that. And you just kind of laid out some of the many different issues that can come along. But I think also to be able to have surplus embryos where people who are open to donating, the field has really kind of moved away from that in the last decade or so, because with, as we talked about in our main episode, a lot of places now moving to more of either a shared donor or a frozen donor model for eggs, you don't have people having a donor who had an amazing cycle and they got 25 eggs and they have 15 embryos and they only wanted one or two children. Now I feel like we're not creating as many excess embryos as we used to from within the donor population. And that, at least historically, used to be a group that was more open to donating embryos. I think there was that sort of sense of already being open to (laughs) genetics and feeling like you were helped out by some else and this is a way of kind of paying that forward but at least in our practice the majority of our patients that are doing donor egg it's not as common now that they would have embryos that they didn't use um, to even consider donating i remember the max number of eggs when i worked in the or was from a donor she and it was back in the day where it was like one to one so she had a recipient that was going to get all of her eggs and she got 74 eggs and i'm like oh, what wow. <laughs> i'm like oh man cool. it's so many and it's and nowadays those would be broken up into like lots of 6 or 12 so they're used a little bit more efficiently now but yeah it's Right. It was different back in the day. So yeah, now you can see why we don't have as many embryos because we're only doing small lots of things and we're not creating as many. But then there's also the other thing that's become a little bit more common is pre-implantation genetic screening. So checking the, the chromosomes of embryos. So we're finding less embryos that are normal. So people have less normal embryos to transfer as well. And I think that also sometimes the process of doing all that can make it a little bit harder to donate because 
there's something psychologically different about going through all that and being told, oh, you have two normal embryos. One is this female. I mean, it just makes it seem more real, I think, to people in terms of that yes. reproductive potential than when you had um, embryos where you didn't know as much information. So yes, we're not storing as many embryos because most people will discard an embryo that they know is abnormal and unable to cause a pregnancy. But then the ones that are left, you have a much higher chance of pregnancy with them, but it also can seem a lot more real and therefore a little bit harder to imagine just putting out there for someone else to use. And there are many different models. You know, some places are more of, obviously, as you said in your main episode, nobody's claiming to be anonymous anymore, but some are kind of a model where you don't have any connection or any even awareness of whether pregnancy results, or you can have kind of full contact type situations where people meet each other and have ongoing connections. And it's amazing to see the many different ways that programs have set up options for donation. Yes. And along those lines too, what I would say is that's one of the reasons um, I think that many internal in-house programs did close down or do close down is because they were previously anonymous. It was a very simple, very straightforward process versus since we know that's not the case anymore, they would need to move to more of an open model. And that is a different model and would require a different program. When we talk about the different ways to donate or receive embryos, it's important to keep in mind that there's agencies and organizations, as we mentioned, there's clinics, and then there's people that meet each other on their own. So under organizations or agencies, historically, many of the embryo donation agencies they're more selective in who they might choose to place on a waiting list to receive donor embryos. And they also might be more what we call faith-based. So for some people, that's wonderful. They meet the criteria. They're a married heterosexual couple that have been married for five years. But for many, many other people that might be looking at embryo donation as an option, they don't fall under that criteria. Therefore, there's only a few that actually have no restrictions on who might be able to be a recipient. So in other words, you could be a single mom by choice. You could be a same-sex couple. You could be partnered and not married. So I personally believe we need more programs that are out there because they really are apples to oranges. And the other programs that I originally mentioned, what they do is they focus more on an adoption model. So that adoption model means a home study and treating an embryo donation as if it's a live birth adoption. And right or wrong, and no matter what your political beliefs or ethical or moral beliefs might be, an embryo in the eyes of the law, at least now, is still considered property. So it's not considered a person. And so the adoption model doesn't work for a lot of lawyers because there's no way to legally mm -hmm. adopt the embryo that's not a person yet. So I know that's a little bit confusing. The other thing I would say is, and I'm seeing a huge influx and a huge increase on people meeting each other on all kinds of Facebook groups um, and other social media ways and platforms, which I get that that is definitely a method that's being used a lot. However, I caution anybody that I'm working with in terms of the internet is also a place and just because it's embryo donation, it can struggle with the same issues of, do we really know who you're talking to? Do they really have embryos available? Have they really picked you? Has there ever been a case of like embryo adoption catfishing? I've worked with patients for sure that have been in those scenarios. And I also have worked with even donors who they are talking to three different people, but maybe you think you're the only one that the potential donor is talking to. And so what I just really try and tell our recipients is you've been through a lot already emotionally. Do you have the emotional bandwidth to potentially be 
embryo donation catfished, as right. you say. Yeah. The other thing I think that once again, it seems so much more simple than it is. Okay. So let's say you meet each other and usually people will often come to the clinic and they'll say they're friends. Well, they are friends. They've met each other on Facebook. They're friends in a sort. They're Facebook friends. And so I think what they don't realize, though, is, okay, great. These people, they say they're going to give me their embryos. Well, even if you have embryos, you got to find a clinic. You've got to find a transfer. So that leads to, well, oh, gosh, I have to go. Oh, my clinic says I have to go to an attorney, which they should be saying. They should be following our American Society of Reproductive Medicine guidelines, which there's new guidances that I helped create that say donors and recipients should have counseling. They should have a legal clearance letter. Some clinics require way more FDA testing because suddenly the person that donated to you used to be a fertility patient and then they became a parent and now they're becoming a donor and they never set out to be a donor. They never thought they would have extra embryos. So the biggest caution I would say is that's where you've got to do that legwork on your own then. You've got to pay for an attorney if you're receiving those embryos. You have to pay for the counseling. There's joint counseling between the donors and the recipients. There's finding a clinic. There's figuring out the FDA stuff. There's shipping of embryos. I'm not trying to discourage that as a family building Mm -hmm. option. That's where I personally feel like it is better to go with an established agency or program, or if your clinic has a program, I just say buyer beware if you're finding embryos online. Now you mentioned in the main episode how they have the open access laws for people that are being sperm or egg donors. Is there anything like that for embryo donation? Yes. It falls under the same thing where that access of that information should be available to that future donor embryo conceived child. I think the big difference that people that work in this field, we understand, obviously from the emotional component, these are in the majority of cases going to be future children that are full genetic siblings to your child or your children. I have had a few cases where someone had extra embryos that they tried to use a batch of their embryos. Perhaps they divorced, perhaps it just didn't work. And then they're donating the embryos and they do not, they so far have not had any living children. However, that's really, really rare. And sometimes what we see too, which again, emotionally can be so complicated is Perhaps family one donates to family two, and this is in case of having a lot of embryos, family two donates to family three and four. So suddenly we're talking about perhaps five families that are all parents to the same genetic children related. And really, if you think about it, even in traditional adoption, it would be pretty rare that a person would have five, six, seven children that they would choose to place for adoption. So that makes that really different. And the emotional burden sometimes really tough of who's going to keep up with all this, right? Who's who's going to be the go-between? What if couple three and four want to know each other, but couple two doesn't? So that's another, just a big challenge that we definitely come across or see. From the donor perspective, I think, though, you know, for some people, definitely that feels morally, ethically like the right thing to do. So for them, they can't imagine having extra embryos and not at least trying to give those embryos a chance of life or at least giving someone else the ability to try and become parents. And they see it as a very altruistic thing. There's so many different uh, avenues we could look at. And again, that's why counseling is so important because most people's views evolve and change. You know, when you're starting fertility treatment, all you're thinking about is like hoping that maybe this will end in giving you a child. And so when you're looking at paperwork that says excess embryos, that seems like you can't even imagine that could be a possibility you find yourself in. But as you said, if you are 
you know, have a child and you watch them grow up, all of a sudden, sometimes those embryos can feel different to you than what they might have seemed like in the beginning. So mm -hmm. it's such a good topic to, to go into. And especially as you mentioned in the start with the Dobbs decision, and now having many states that are putting so called personhood measures where yes. you're going to define, I mean, I think we were just at the same conference where Louisiana has had a law for a while that does give embryos rights and other states might go in that same direction. So there's going to be a lot more state to state variation. And that makes this even more complicated, too, if you were trying to receive embryos from a state that maybe had different laws than your state had. That is so true. And that's, as you said, at our conference, we heard a lot about that. And we are all just sort of stay tuned. We don't know how this is going to affect things for sure. We do know, though, that there's always going to be people that want donate donated embryos. And there's always going to be people that have extra embryos and find themselves in a situation that they, like you say, they never pictured themselves. They were never setting out to be a donor of embryos. And then with these children too, we definitely need more data and research. A lot of the embryo donor conceived adults now I mean, really, they're only reaching the ages probably, you know, 26, 30. I mean, I met and interviewed a 26-year-old woman. But once we start to get above that, it's hard because we, we just don't know a lot. Hopefully, we will continue that research and we will know and understand more about the needs of the children as well as the families because it's a very unique family building model. This is such an interesting conversation and there's so many facets and things to consider. And more to come, right? Like with this conference, we're going to do a whole nother one about like what laws are already out there and what laws are potentially on the ballot. And, you know, there are things that are potentially going to change a lot in terms of how embryos are treated um, state to state and how complex it is. So this is just a tiny little snack sized episode to delve into what's going to be a continuing complicated option. <laughs> And if you have gone through the whole full episode and this episode and when you haven't been around the last year, we're referring to the Supreme Court decision that reversed Roe versus Wade um, and the right to abortion. In case you weren't aware, that's what we've been talking about this whole time. But um, yes, there's so much more to come and so much more to discuss. But thank you so much, Melanie, for joining us today. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of the Whole Pineapple Podcast. We hope it was helpful. If you know someone who could benefit from hearing the podcast, we hope you'll share it with them. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review The Whole Pineapple on your favorite podcast app. Every rating and review makes us easier to find. This podcast is sponsored by Seattle Reproductive Medicine and is produced by Audiotocracy Podcast Production. We'll see you next time. Have a delicious week.